Hello, I'm Tony Smario. It's September 15th, 2017. Coming to you from my father, brosal.org YouTube channel. And I want to talk about what's coming next in 2017, in this uh, 21st century of ours, where as I watch more and more of the propaganda through whether it's mainstream media on the on those little news feeds I get or the YouTube providers who I'm watching less and less of because it's obvious to me now. YouTube is big brother. The uh, the story is being the, the argument, the discussion is being scripted and steered, giving us memes I mean, whatever happened to the mandala effect? That was huge a year ago when everybody was going crazy about that. Now we got flat earth. You know, NASA's all fake. And now we've got transhumanism and they're making the weather. Everybody seems to be on to the weather manipulation now. And what's so funny in all this is, meanwhile, I'm just watching a news uh, clip today or the last couple of days where they refer to you know, what's going on in Afghanistan, because that's in the news again. We've got to send more troops, because why? Well, as this reporter in mainstream media referred to Afghanistan as the headquarters of Al-Qaeda that pulled off the 9-11 terrorism. They're like the, they were the seat of that terrorism 15 years ago, 16 years ago. And we're still trying to undermine the seat of fundamentalist terrorism that was responsible for 9-11. You know, in our day and age, that really does ignore the mountain of evidence against such an explanation that even the, you know, the Saudis, you know, everybody in the world seems to come out and say, you know, 9-11 is an inside job, that you can't possibly pretend that even with the evidence that you say you have, that it was all done by, you know, some Arab terrorists hijacking planes, how'd they get the buildings to fall in their own footprint? Who, who set up the demolition, right? In whatever way those buildings were demolished, whether they were, whether it's some fancy method that we're not so aware of using technology that we are aware of, or whether, as Judy Wood has been pointing out for years, you know, nothing fits the evidence except some sort of energy weapon that somehow changed the molecular structure of the buildings and turn them to dust as a way of, and, and then the explosions that they everybody hear, hears and that you see are obviously a way in which they facilitated all of this collapse on a, at a given moment, but that the structure itself had been affected by some energy weapon. We don't know, but any way you slice it, show me how the Arabs managed to, you know, show me how Al-Qaeda and these... Afghanistani rebels from their cave in Afghanistan managed to get three buildings to fall in their footprint because they hijacked some planes and flew them into buildings. Come on. So to keep presenting this that simple side of it in the news, it's more than absurd and offensive and all these things. It, it really is telling to someone like an investigator you know, what are they trying to hide? Why, why wouldn't you acknowledge what an absurdly transparent lie the official story is, like the magic bullet theory of the Kennedy assassination, and that even if we don't know who really did it, we just know that it didn't, it didn't all happen from a cave in Afghanistan. So, you know, that's never acknowledged. So the deeper tell is the way that the momentum of a surface story continues to flow, ignoring the momentum of the undercurrent, right? The alternative media, the alternative story, all the alternative facts that people know. You know, why do you keep talking about hurricanes and fires and droughts and severe weather, but you don't talk about weather manipulation when in the alternative media, all they talk about now, I mean, it's one of the new memes. Like flat earth. Flat earth isn't quite as popular in the moment, but weather manipulation, oh, that's popular. Transhumanism, that's popular. Because that's the new scare. And in the mainstream media, of course, it's North Korea. Russian aggression. All of these things, 
that never again in the mainstream media comparing it to Jesus. Is this anything like the 60s and 70s when we had the big red scare, you know, communism, and we had the Cold War, and we just, when you go back and look at either the media presentation or the the other kind of media called movies and entertainment, the television and movies, you look how serious, boy, oh boy, the generals, they weren't portrayed as being, ah, you know, Russia, they, nothing they can do. That's what the historians have pointed out. Russia was controlled by the same people. They were no threat. China's never been a threat. All controlled by the same people. But boy, when you look back at the time, it sure wasn't presented that way, was it? Oh boy, the gem, there was that. It was presented to the public as that the people who have real knowledge are truly concerned. The generals and the, and the social, political professors and scientists are truly concerned and they're giving you all the facts. Well, Russia has this many bombers and their capabilities and their strategy and they would most likely go after our infrastructure and they would most likely and they want to change the minds of our young people and they're infiltrating our... Right? And it was all very serious. Just like it is today with North Korea and Russia and China. And yet, if I'm correct in looking at the pattern and looking at the true... Uh, you know, the only real sort of underly underlying currents that make sense, meaning, you know, planned world wars, a financial system that's been used for hundreds of years to control and to move forward a plan that someone has, that that's what's really going on. So that on the surface, of course, we get a completely fabricated, illusionary, you know, magical Hollywood vision of reality in which everything's turned into a movie for us. And if that's the case, then you have to ask yourself, huh, what are, what are they really doing that the movie has to be so different from reality? Why can't they just put a twist on reality the way we've always imagined it? We've always imagined that the politicians were, you know, they were crooked, but they were honestly representing a ideology, Democrat and Republican, right? Democrats had a particular ideology that needed to be represented as a left-leaning vision, and Republicans represented the right-leaning vision, and that's just natural. And so, obviously, these are legitimate representations of public opinion. And, of course, ideologically they are. There's a left side of public opinion and a right side. But does our left and right politics represent that, or do they represent a play? on that paradigm where they're using the fact that there is such a thing as a left-right vision but they're not really representing it they're pretending to represent it in order to control the discussion and the direction that it goes and so that's the you know the the real insight i've been trying to point out for years and you know it looks like i've been right you know with regard to isis you know it, how many months now are we right on the edge of getting rid of them, right on the edge? You know, apparently the Iraqi army. It was a coalition of the whole world three years ago. America dropping 50,000 bombs, you know, whatever, a year on them or something. And all we ever see now as we're rooting out as these vicious and final battles, you know, all we ever still see is the same sort of footage, bunch of bunch of uh, people standing around or moving through an empty area or moving through an area of devastated buildings that just look like they've been thoroughly bombed and you know, there's nothing left there. Can't see a car on the street or bicycle or any remnants of human life. You, never once any video drone footage of actual fighting. Never once looks like the cameras that are rolling into a scene right after a battle like in Vietnam. Right after the battle, dead bodies laying everywhere, freshly blown up buildings all around. No, nope. always the same pictures of, you know, who knows where, who knows when. Buildings that just look like they've been demolished and never rebuilt from years ago. Who knows when? With some soldiers walking through. It looks like movie scene after movie scene. And they don't even show you the movie scene or the fight scenes. Why? Because there are no real fight scenes in that way, I don't think. I think it's all a movie. They're, you know, they're 
They're dispersing people out of an area they need cleared. It's you got to get out, but we don't want to get out. Well, you have to get out. And, and that's done all over. I mentioned how right around here when Punta de Mita, this old fishing area, this little peninsula where for generations families have been living and fishing, they sold it to the rich developers. Bill Gates was one of the investors. A couple of golf courses, Four Seasons Hotel, you know, gated. You know, you know I call it private Punta Mita versus free Punta Mita. You know, private Punta Mita, you, you got to have a reservation. So they came in and just kicked, you know, you got to go. And they forcibly moved those people that didn't want to take their offer. And so because you don't see any evidence, North Korea, the big threat, and they keep showing us the same pictures of Kim Jong-un standing over the same whatever it is, the same pictures of missiles going off. I mean, would it really be that hard to stage that if it wasn't real? And if it was real, you know, where are the real rallies of the people? Where's the real frustration of the people ready to die? Because that's what's going to happen if you shoot a rocket at Japan or Guam. You know, you're going to die. I mean, obviously, you're going to lose millions of people, hundreds of thousands anyway, in an initial re response. The people are really behind that rhetoric? Show me that. Show me that I should believe North Korea is ready to... To, to get to start that kind of war, to get into that kind of world. They're that frustrated. Their people are that ready. You couldn't just drop a bunch of flyers and tell them, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un's about to, you know, get millions of you annihilated. So we're just wondering, are you with them or are you not with them? Because if you're with them, you know, and we're not going to feel bad about annihilating you. But if you're not with them, then, you know, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to support you to take this idiot out and see what kind of response you get. I mean, we can start color revolutions over there in Islam area, right? Where, boy, oh boy, those people, if there's a strict sort of obedience, <laughs> but we'll get them into the Western lifestyle, depose their leaders, right? Get in there with NATO, drag their leaders through the street, and kill them. But boy, you can't touch North Korea. They're just... Boy, oh boy, they threaten the world. Week in and week out, day in and day out, year in and year out, they threaten the world like it's a big movie. So I think that the more this goes on, the easier it should be to see through it if you're not caught up in it. If you're caught up in it, you think, oh, why don't I, you know, why isn't Tony seeing how important North Korea is about to start war? Oh my God, this is serious. This is really serious. I, I say that's what they want you to think. Because obviously it's not. What's serious is they have a plan. What's serious is all of the telltale signs of their propaganda, their confusion, and the eschatology that predicted, you know, wars and rumors of wars, nation rise against nation, earthquakes and famines and pestilence in diverse places. But don't be alarmed at that. You know, why not? Obviously it's going to be alarming. He starts off by saying, don't let anyone deceive you, right? And then goes on to say, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, famine. Don't be alarmed at that. But the end is not yet. So I have to keep reflecting on that because if what I'm reading is correct, all of their talk is not the end. It's really a setup for something. And I'm going to continue to, to um, until I see something different, I'm going to continue to say it's a setup for peace. The war, peace, war plan. All of this fake war. Whether they're killing people, of course they're killing people, but the wars that they talk about aren't real. They're these rumors of wars that you're going to hear about. These are the things over there, this ISIS, right? That's not a real war. That's fake. North Korea, that's not a real war. That's fake. South China Sea, there's nothing going on there except whatever the investors are doing to set up for the future. So... All of these things are these rumors of wars. Don't be alarmed. See, it's not going to lead to any, that. The end that's coming isn't coming because of these wars and rumors of wars. So what is coming? What to expect? What's coming next? I, I believe that because exhaustion is what is needed to get the people into this position where the peace can look like such a relief 
because no one can analyze it. Just like right now, no one can analyze North Korea because they're bombarded with propaganda of panic, 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 panic. So nobody, you know, is listening to a voice like mine and saying, think about it, think about it, think about it. They're, nobody's thinking about it. And when they give you what appear to you to be these trusted voices, these serious generals, these Harvard professors of sociology or political science, oh boy, what does Tony know compared to these guys? These guys are concerned about North Korea. These guys are concerned about nuclear war with Russia. These guys are concerned about the escalation in the South China Sea. Tony's saying it's all a movie, right? So if you're on to the fact that it's all a movie, okay, then where's it going? Where are we going with this in this war, peace, war plan? What are we looking for? Well, because we also have this idea that, you know, white horse comes out as a first seal in Revelation. Let's just play with these symbols for a minute. White horse is righteousness. It's also symbol of peace. Um, he's a warrior coming without a loaded weapon, right? He's got a bow with no arrow. So he's a warrior. He's a righteous warrior. He's not a priest coming with a, a priestly symbol. He's not a politician with a flag. He's on a horse with a bow. A bow is a, a weapon, but it's not loaded. So he's a warrior coming out with peace is the way, you know, that seems to be the best um, analogy of the symbol. And then the second seal is a red horse. And the conspicuous qualities of the rider on the red horse is they're given power to take peace from the earth. Again, reinforces this idea that the rider on the white horse with the unloaded bow is bringing peace. The rider on the red horse is given power to take peace. So that combined with Daniel, who when Jesus said, don't be alarmed at that, the end is not yet. Then when you're handed over to be persecuted, Jesus tells his disciples and he tells them when you see the desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So Jesus, in this supposed prophecy, brings in Daniel's vision of the destruction of the temple, which has to do with stopping the sacrifice in the middle of a seven-year covenant that's made with many. So, of course, over the years, when we've added up all these eschatological perspectives, it would look like, from the eschatological viewpoint, what we would anticipate is that at some point, a seven-year covenant is going to be made that allows the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, something that for decades now has been in the mainstream crosshairs. You've got a temple institute. They've been talking about how they've got all the priests trained. They've even got the red heifers to be slaughtered. You know, they, they've got all the temple uh, furniture reconstructed. You know, they have plans how, when, to rebuild the temple. Years ago, my father... Uh, following the you know the rise of the Hashemite king into prominence with the accords in the 90s to give the Hashemite special consideration in the peace talks with regard to Temple Mount because they look after the, the holy sites of the Muslims there. We see how uh, the issue with the Hashemite king had asked to build a fifth minaret in these negotiations that had to do with this you know, everybody see in a future when there's a temple rebuilt, right? It's not an, oh, that'll never happen, is what I'm trying to get at with fitting it into the real world of what we're looking for. It's not like, it's not like some uh, pie-in-the-sky prophecy. This is something that's in our modern world very relevant. And so it would seem that the way that eschatology paints it is that there will come a covenant if Daniel is this accurate prophecy that we expect, it'll be for seven years. I don't know how that's possible that it could be written that way and they will make one for seven years. That, that seems really crazy, except that I'm seeing they want people to think it's the prophetic times. They're stirring this pot of it's the end, it's the end, and the Messiah's coming, and the Mahdi's coming, and the, they're feeding all that side because what else can you do? Those people aren't going to go away, so you got to co-op them. And so they have to create this end time. They have to bring on the Messiah. They have to bring on the reason 
that this whole religious story causes the war. So they can blame it. Because in their world, there's no Messiah. That's an allegory. That's something people have got lost in. And there's no God coming back. But as long as people are willing to believe that, they're happy to use that story to bring about their golden age in which they are God. And that's, again, what does Revelation say? Someone stands in the temple and declares themselves as God, in the place of God. Now, they give us that story through their propaganda and the Christian, uh, you know, brain-dead misunderstanding of reality, that that'll be some sort of Lucifer, Satan, Antichrist, spirit being, working miracles and claiming to be God. I say no. That will be their Messiah doing the miracles that they're doing, beguiling the people. And the claim will be that we are God. I am God, meaning this Maitreya, perhaps, this master. In other words, I'm the closest thing, just like Jesus said, because that's what they're trying to undermine. They're trying to show you how it was all an allegory. And so the Maitreya is going to come along, I would imagine, and say, you know, I'm who is returned, just like Jesus in his time. I'm the one that's returned. We are all God. If you want to see God, I'm God. Right? You're God too, but I'm the one who's come to show you, to lead you. I'm proving it by my miracles. Right? Just what those Pharisees were looking for when the real Christ came, if Jesus is the Christ, as Christians believe, then when the real Christ came and worked real miracles, supernatural miracles, they didn't believe him. They, they said, show us a sign, you know, fly in the air, do something. Well, that's what their, this person's going to do to beguile the world. He's going to do the kind of miracles they wanted to see. Show us a sign. Okay, how about this? And the Christians have already been set up to make the world believe, or at least the ones listening to them, the religious people, that this is through some supernatural means, some devil who's fighting God, who's, I, I suppose, equal to Jesus in the fact that they are a supernatural entity from heaven that can do what Jesus can do and wants to wear the crown of Jesus. But that's not really what the scripture says. And there is no such entity ever, ever demonstrated in scripture. And so the not Messiah is the one that they're going to sell as the Messiah. I believe that they're going to beguile with the miracles they know how to do because they are God. Their miracles have to do with science, which is their method. Their God's method is the scientific method, which they hide from us what they really know, right? The technology that the Tesla showed them that they got rid of Tesla for and took the world in a different direction. It's, it hadn't been that long, you guys, right? You look at the big picture, that you get your hands on this and aha, here's what we need, okay. And now here we are a hundred years later and it's all in play. Okay, let's get a computer in everybody's hands. Let's get our voice into everybody's ear. Let's get our propaganda, our subliminal messaging our electronic frequency manipulation, whatever we can do. Time to get it in everybody's hand because now, now we push the buttons. Now we, we push our plan to that point where we bring about our Messiah. Beguile the world. Make the peace and then break the peace according to the scripture. <laughs> it's already written in the, middle of the, in the middle of the week. He'll declare himself to be God. So if you really were a supernatural devil and it was all written that way, why wouldn't you just change the script? You know, why don't you flip the script and do something different? I'm making an eight-year covenant and I'm breaking it after the second year. Ha, 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 ha. There you go. Now we got it, guys. I mean, I'm supernatural. I'm the devil. I'm, why would I have to just do what it says? Well, what if it already happened in time and there isn't anyone to control it? Only God has the ultimate control outside time so that that result can be shown what happened. And there is no changing it because there is no force 
outside time that can alter it other than God. So anyway, what we're, what we seem to be coming to now is this, is this plan where their golden age, remember, is one in which all religion is dead and the, the true light of the Luciferian doctrine is brought into light. So now let's look at, you know, we looked at the eschatological view of what we expect, you know, seven year covenant in the middle, whoever made the covenant will stop the covenant and prospectively looking at this other idea of the war, you know, the white horse comes out at the making of the covenant, we, we think, and the red horse at the breaking of the covenant when peace is taken from the earth. And now it's war and that war is going to be devastating. And so this is part of what I want to get to that's got to do with the occult version in which they're trying to, you know, get to a golden age where all this belief in something other than ourselves and our own responsibility to move forward is what they see has screwed everything up. It's the crutch. It's the excuse. It's the lack of, you know, sort of uh, personal integrity and responsibility that's caused the world to to be what it is and that the only solution is to control the world to control the people because the, the people are dangerous it's been what spinoza was after it's been what john calvin was after it's been what darwin was after it all flows from this same concept that you know even according to the scripture you know, nobody's righteous and everybody's dangerous and everyone's evil and everyone's damned so what do you do with all these people? Give them freedom to rape and pillage? No, you control them. And so the golden age is one in which the control is now in the hands of the people that know best, right? And that's this Maitreya that's going to come and enlighten them on their end. That what you know, if, if they're waiting for something, it's this final enlightenment in the natural way in which consciousness is evolving and part of that in their view will be the the natural sort of culling of the people who can't move forward into this new age now you know to point out that they've been killing and are manipulating the culling and actually you know fabricating the culling is pretty easy to see that, that they feel it's you know, what are they going to do wait and be part of the people who die or are they going to make it happen just like you do, it, you know, a farmer does. You don't just let the sick animals and, well, let's see which ones survive. No, you go in there and get the sick ones, separate the healthy ones, and, you know, that's what consciousness does. So they feel they're doing, you know, the Christians, of course, and all the stupidity, the propaganda has to paint them as these evil devils. But no, not in their light. Listen to Manly P. Hall. Read Morals and Dogma. That's not how they see it. But they do see it as a responsibility to be beyond good and evil, as Nietzsche pointed out. And they've got to then take the you know, responsibility that eugenics um, demonstrates, as Darwin and his followers understood. And you know, they've got to cull the herd. They've got to make the world safe for consciousness to evolve. And so that's what's really going on in their mind. And that's why it's all justified, this world of lies and keeping the people deceived, as it says in Morals and Dogma, they're dangerous. I mean, what can you do with all these people? You have to give them something to follow that keeps them occupied or otherwise engaged, dis disengaged from, from confronting the people that rule the world because they, the way they feel, these people that rule the world, you can't trust all the people and just try and explain to them everything we know from whether scripture or eugenic, you know, uh, na natural biology, that it's just, that's not how it works. You got your crazies, you got your less developed, you got, you know, born wrong. And you can't pretend you can include everybody. That's a pipe dream. So anyway, this is where their world's going. So when you combine the two is all, you've got this eschatological picture of, you know, war leading to peace that really looks to be just a pretense for a great war. You have Jesus saying wars and rumors of wars. Don't be alarmed. The end is not yet. You have Albert Pike saying you got to deceive the masses because they're dangerous. You have a world in which the masses are terribly deceived about everything 
pitted against each other in the divide and conquer method of the Caesars. You, you can clearly see the Machiavellian schemes of the people in charge telling the people how, you know, how they just want to help them, right? The torturer that tells you, oh, I just want to help you. I, I want this to stop. I, I don't want disease and pain torture for you. Meanwhile, they're the ones doing it to you. And why? Because they're scared to lose their power. They know their hearts are evil. They know their power is ill-gotten. They know it's not fair in their hearts that they have everything and everyone has nothing. And yet, do they want to share it? No, they want to keep it. And they don't want to be threatened. And so it's that desire that keeps the world the way it is and the people in charge, you know, doing whatever it takes. And whatever it takes is this continuously more evil mechanism to keep the people down, to keep them misguided, to keep them, you know, dying in every way instead of being your equal, instead of seeing them that way and sharing with people. And, you know, that's what the real Christ pointed out. That's what the real vision of God is is absolute equality in this life, that nobody's righteous, and so it's all a brotherhood of man in this life, and the only way we show our God-likeness is when is in brotherly love. We simply are willing to give ourselves for each other. And when we all do that, we have sort of the closest thing to a, a utopian society that we can in this earth. We're still going to fall and break arms, perhaps get diseases, get sick and die, get cold and freeze to death. Love doesn't change that. Death in this embodiment seems to be the process, the natural process in which something's being done, <laughs> in which life is occurring. But this, the philosophy that goes with it, the metaphysic that's behind it, you know, it, if, if Jesus of Nazareth is correct, it's a matter of everybody simply giving themselves for each other as a way of life, and then all life is as good as it can be. So when you look at you know what we've constructed, it seems to be almost the opposite. And when you look at who's in charge, they certainly don't present that Christian ethic or vision, uh, and they certainly don't live it. You know, they have billions of dollars, and they make laws to protect themselves and make tax haven so they don't even have to pay their fair share of the taxes and all that kind of stuff so you know this is all the world you, you can't pretend that unless you change that you have any kind of a world so to distract from that we get our movies about good guys and bad guys to distract from that we get our visualization through media of these wars and rumors of wars of this real life of politics and left and right trying to do the best thing when it's clear none of the people in charge are really trying to do the best thing except for the best thing being keep a very small group of them isolated and then those people seem to have a plan because the wars and the funding and the, the military banking religious social economic movement appears to march in step. They all wear friggin' ties. They all have parliaments or some sort of system in which it looks like they represent the people, and yet none of the people ever wind up with some society where everybody shares. None of the people, I mean, you know, that's always the, the story from the top, doing the best for the people. We're all doing the best for the people. We're all doing the best for the people. And yet, in every system, no matter where it is, you have elites that seem to own everything and live like kings. And then you have the, the serfs that seem to just barely be able to survive. And then you have that very small group, depending on where you are, in between struggling to stay ab above the serfs and dreaming that they could break through to become one of the elites and usually willing to do anything that society has made acceptable, you know, to do that. Step on their fellow neighbors, uh, you know, benefit off the suffering of others, you know, whatever it takes. If it propels you up into that group of the elites, then we just envy you. We don't pity you. So the system that's been set up supports the false world, the movie. All of that's got to be for a reason because the people in charge certainly have enough money to show the truth or have a different scheme, right? 
try something else. Let's get rid of all the weapons. And, you know, they, they could do anything. They do do anything. And what they do is wars and rumors of wars. Jesus said, for some reason, don't be alarmed at that. I wonder why. I wonder why today it seems so alarming. North Korea seems ready to do its thing. ISIS seems ready to break out into worse terrorism all over the world. The weather seems to be threatening to really bring on what I want to close with today. And that is, you know, it's predicted that famine and pestilence will come. They're already showing us, even in in our first world like Texas, I saw that they're spraying the streets of San Diego for hepatitis A virus. They're spraying the streets with chlorine water. In the all, all the homeless people are living on the streets again. Hep A breakout, right? So they're having to go spray the streets. In Greece, they had a ship sink oil spill. So all these beautiful beaches, a huge cleanup of oil killing stuff in Greece. Okay, what are the prophecies? The sea's all going to die at some point. The fish are all going to die. You know, so who, you know, the people out there that keep looking for the new, you know, this hope. What is the hope, you guys, if it isn't in the scriptural finale that God himself's going to make it all new again? What's what's the hope and what are we watching for? What's coming? So whether you're looking at the, the occult version of wanting to, you know, get rid of everybody and being ready to do it, having all the technology and being ready to get to their golden age as soon as they can, and you can see the things that are put in place to do that and the way that the war is even at the door, the pestilence is even at the door. And you look at the eschatological view that says they're going to build a temple, make a deal for seven years, and then halfway through it, break that deal. That's going to result in the war. All of that's going to result in a sort of earth-changing pestilence, war and famine and all this as never seen before. So what's coming in the 21st century would appear to be that, even if it's somewhere down the road in the 21st century. I don't know what there is to look forward to now, except the practice of of brotherly love, knowing that at any moment, under any conditions, we have the opportunity to jump right into that spirit of God and practice brotherly love in which the promise is, you know, you, you live forever. So you you don't really have to be so worried about what's physically coming to this world over these next years or decades. But it would seem that we're in a moment where they're bringing the world to exhaustion so that they can prepare for this grand illusion, this beguilement, these miracles that are going to save the world from whatever is so desperate at that point that the world is happy to accept, uh, not only happy to accept it, defend it, that this is the answer, at least to half the world. I, I, My projection is that the two witnesses talked about that are going to be against this are going to come from the Shia world and the Shia crescent. And it's going to be that alignment, which of course is going to include Russia and China at some point. In the beginning, it might just be Iran and the Shia crescent saying, hey, no, this is no good. This temple agreement, no, 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 this is, you can't, we can't do this. We refuse to accept this peace, whereas Russia and China can be saying, no, this is great, this is good for everybody. But as soon as it's broken and war breaks out, then all of a sudden the lines are drawn and there'll be a reason for Russia and China to side with Iran. And you have the war that I believe is is not, it just happens upon history but has has been projected for over a hundred years to be the means by which the people who have all the money and are scared of the masses can finally enter what they call the golden age, which is the state of no more fear. No more fear. They just they just advance under complete control and you know from that point forward. So that's what I think is coming in the 21st century, guys. Thanks for being here and talk to you soon.